<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. I uh, hope everyone's having a good day. Have we done okay by everyone so far today? Yes, I see some nods. Very good. Thank you. Um, well, this is one of my favorite parts of the day. We've got a uh, wonderful panel assembled here um, with a, a great moderator. I think this is going to be a wonderful interactive conversation. And um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Percival, uh, who will be moderating today's panel. So uh, Dr. Percival is an adjunct professor at the Wharton School of Business and a former associate dean of the MBA program. Uh, he's taught at a number of very prestigious uh, universities across the country. He's developed custom educational programs for some of the largest companies in the world. And he's a consultant to the FTC, the US Department of Labor, Ford, DuPont, PwC, and others. Um, so he's extremely successful, and not just in the ivory tower, but um, on Wall Street and with uh, some of the most influential brands that we know. Uh, he will be moderating today's panel, and he will be introducing that panel, uh, or allowing them to introduce themselves in just a moment. So um, have your questions ready. Uh, there will be some questions that Dr. Percival will bring to the panel, plenty of give and take. Um, but then uh, when he's ready to go out to the audience, we'd be happy to have your participation. So without further ado, Dr. Percival. Thanks, John. Let me just spend a couple of minutes introducing the other members of the panel. And after I introduce each one, I'm going to ask them to tell us a little bit about their organization and a little bit about their path to becoming a CFO, because I think that'll be important context for the conversations that we're going to have this afternoon. So immediately to my left is Tom Fitzsimmons. He is VP of FP&A for TMP Worldwide Advertising and Communications. That's a mouthful. And Tom is going to tell us a little bit more about TMP and also a little bit about his path to becoming a CFO. Well, thank you, John. Um, TMP Worldwide is a digital recruitment uh, advertising agency. We specialize in developing uh, branding and talent acquisition for our clients using uh, various social media and web-enabled uh, attraction strategies. Uh, headquartered here in New York, we are global footprint uh, operating in uh, half a dozen countries around the world. And I was telling these, uh, our panelists here that I, this is my second time around with the company, and it's also the second time that I've replaced the same person as CFO. Uh, <laughs> uh, neither, neither in bad circumstances, he's decided to move on to other things, and I and I benefited. Um, I've been lucky, I, I've known the CEO of the company for uh, probably 18, 19 years, and when my predecessor decided to leave, she reached out and said, I have an opening. And it, because of the company and the culture and, and the relationship I already had, it was an easy choice for me to go back uh, to uh, and rejoin the company. So that has been my, my immediate path. And, and just, a, you know, I, I've had, a trail of jobs through financial planning and uh, actually operations in IT and some HR uh, in between before I finally uh, landed in COO slash CFO uh, roles. Thank you. I asked Tom if that path was like being divorced and remarried. He said it was very similar. Um, <laughs> so uh, Cheryl Young is next. Uh, she is the uh, CFO of Easter Seals of New Jersey. Um, Cheryl? So I am, New, uh, Easter Seals New Jersey is a disability service provider. We are a not-for-profit, and when I say that, most of the time people think we're really small. We're a $100 million budget, and we have 1,700 employees across the state of New Jersey. We enable individuals and families living with disabilities to live, learn, work, and play in their community with equality, dignity, and independence, and that's a mouthful. Uh, we cross all levels and all types of disabilities. So we do mental health, we do developmental disability, residential housing, workshops, senior programs to help seniors who fell, fall into the poverty level get back into the workforce. You name it, we help people do what they need to do. Um, my path to CFO, um, our joking around earlier is it's all my husband's fault. I only ever wanted to be a corporate treasurer. I spent my entire career. Treasury management was not something they taught in college when I graduated, so I just gave my age away a little bit. It was something you had to learn along the way. I fell into it. I loved it. 
worked my way up to being a corporate treasurer, worked in all areas in finance. So I, I didn't specialize on that way up to being a treasury manager and a corporate treasurer. I did everything from SEC reporting to financial planning, accounts payable, you name it. Got that skill base up. And when I, came, I left New York and went out to New Jersey and my husband said, your next role is a CFO, and I said, not on your life. Seven and a half years at Easter Seals, New Jersey as the CFO. So it works, and it is all his fault, but it's a good thing. Thank you. And last but not least, Rahul Mator is the, uh, also VP of FP&A, yes? I am. At uh, Spension, and uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about Spension and about how he got to be uh, the CFO. All right. So hi, I'm Rahul. Good afternoon. Um, so expansion, we last year did about 900 or so million of revenue. Um, we recently uh, acquired a couple of divisions from Fujitsu, uh, which added about another half a billion of revenue, another 1,100 employees. So now we have about 3,700 employees uh, around the world. Um, Expansion deals with embedded uh, flash memory. So essentially, uh, any piece of memory that goes into uh, some electronics that you may have in your car, or I think in one of the previous pan uh, panels we were talking about, you know, office or home automation and the, the memory that stores the, the data in each of those devices. Um, essentially, these little bitty itty chips uh, that have to be right 100% of the time and that cost less than a head of cabbage. Um, in terms of, of my background, I actually started out from uh, school. I worked for Arthur Anderson in consulting when they were still a reputable company. Um, <laughs> I spent a, a couple of years there and then decided I want to go work in industry for a company that actually made a product. So I spent eight years at a company called KLA Tencore, about a $2 billion semiconductor capital equipment company. Um, and had eight different jobs at, at KLA. So I did many of the same rotations. I did investor relations, I did operations, operations finance. Um, at the end, I had uh, uh, responsibility for our international finance and accounting organizations, which was about 70% of the company's revenue. Then I went to uh, business school and had an incredible finance professor at business school. Okay. <laughs> um, and then shortly afterwards, decided that uh, if I lived in the San Francisco area, I should go play the Silicon Valley lottery. And so I spent six years playing the lottery, and I worked at six different companies in those six years. And I had some fantastic successes. Um, I did get to participate in an IPO and stand at the podium at the New York Stock Exchange. Um, I had some galactic failures as well. Some of those were personal, some of those were company, some of those were industry. But learned a lot um, in terms of different industries, in terms of different geographies. And then after six years of six different companies and six different business cards, decided it was time to come back to a larger company. So reconnected with one of my mentors, who's actually the, the CEO at Expansion. Um, and so he made the mistake of hiring me about a year ago. And so I, I look after finance. Um, and soon after I was hired, I looked after investor relations as well. And then also took on a role helping with the integration of you know, 1,100 new employees from Fujitsu at 29 different sites around the world. And we announced the acquisition and closed in about 91 days. So making sure that each of those folks had a laptop and a place to sit and all of those other things. Thank you. So we got a private company, we've got a publicly traded company, and we've got a not-for-profit, so we've got the bases covered, I think. Um, so now a little context for the conversation this afternoon. Um, at the Wharton School where I teach, um, in the executive education area, we're always interested in new product development. And so we try to tap into the participants in our programs to kind of find out what the issues are, what's going on, what the problems are, looking to develop new programs that can be helpful to them in dealing with their issues. One important source of information to us is the participants in our advanced management program. It's a five week long executive education program. The participants are really fairly senior managers from companies from all over the world. And again, like this group, they're small companies or large companies, they're private, they're publicly traded. We have not-for-profit representations, global, so it's a pretty good cross-section of what's going on out there. It is um, overstated to say we do focus groups. It's not quite that structured, but we tap into them for information. We're having our conversations with these folks, and one thing kept coming up. And it went something like the following. Back home at corporate headquarters or at business unit headquarters, there were some important conversations going on about the future. They had to do with growth. Uh, sometimes it was too much growth. 
but more often it was finding growth, the right kind of growth, profitable growth. Um, and these were important conversations. So you can envision a bunch of senior managers of the business units sitting around a table talking about uh, growth opportunities. What they were telling us was that the contributions to those conversations from the finance folks, quite frankly, were disappointing. That's what they told us. They weren't getting the kind of input from their finance people they're really hoping for. So we uh, probed this a little more to try to find out what the source of this problem was. Sometimes it seemed to take the form of, well, quite frankly, the finance people weren't comfortable in those conversations. It hadn't been their background, hadn't been their training. Um, they weren't really comfortable with this looking forward aspect of finance. They're much more comfortable with what I call the looking back part, the scorekeeping, uh, uh, accurate information about what had happened in the past. Sometimes what they told us was that the analysis that was done by the finance people, quite frankly, was not particularly helpful and compelling. Sometimes they told us that while the analysis was okay, the way they communicated the results of that was not particularly helpful. That they didn't seem to be able to do it in a way that was meaningful to their non-finance colleagues who didn't have the same kind of background that they did. It seemed like there was a real issue out there. So we put together a week-long program for CFOs to try to deal with some of these issues. Um, the objectives are multiple. We try to help CFOs with their strategic thinking somewhat. Um, we also try to pre present some ideas about how to do the analysis a little bit more in a more different way to be more compelling and more meaningful. Focus on KPIs that are going to determine whether financially is going to make sense or not. We have a day in the program that I call, not when the participants are listening, charm school for finance people. Um, <laughs> let's face it, we finance folks can be more charming. Uh, better ways to communicate with our non-finance colleagues, um, the results of our analysis. Also dealing with uh, peers in their finance organization, but also in the business unit uh, a little more effectively. Um, so it's got a number of different objectives. We developed this program, we're starting to work with CFOs, and lo and behold, what we find out is they agree, the CFOs agree that this is a problem, and they're working on it. They understand that they need to be more effective at this looking forward part of finance. So they were in agreement with the folks in our AMP program. The folks at IBM, we had an executive education relationship with them. They were um, doing a survey of CFOs every two years. They found out we were working with CFOs. They came to us and they said, um, maybe we should partner on this. You're working with CFOs, we're working with CFOs. They came to us and asked us to help them put together the questionnaire to process the results. And so we started this in 2008. We tried to find out in the survey, it's, by the way, it's a pretty good cross-section of the survey, too. 1,200 CFOs, uh, again, all over the world, large companies, small companies, publicly traded, private, not-for-profit. We asked them what was on their, their agenda, and um, everything was important, it came out. Um, how, we started to wonder, how are there possibly enough hours in the day of a CFO to be dealing with all this stuff? Some was backward-looking, some was forward-looking. Um, it had to do with uh, human capital management, developing good people. It was a very full agenda. Then we asked them about what they were comfortable with. And what we found, looked for was the gaps between what was important and what were they comfortable and good at. And we found that the looking back part was still important, but they were, felt they were pretty good at it. The looking forward part was the problem. It was becoming more important, and they didn't feel as comfortable doing it. So now we had some data, some empirical results that indicated that what we learned anecdotally was in fact true out there. We did the survey again in 2010, and to make a long story short, if anything, in 2010, the results were even more compelling. That the look, looking forward stuff was becoming more important, but there was not a huge improvement in how comfortable the CFOs were in dealing with this kind of stuff. We also focused on risk management as an important part of this looking forward part and um, tried to find out what was going on out there in risk management. It seemed, you know, clearly in the past, risk management had been housed in the office of the chief financial officer because they're very narrowly defined to be uh, exchange rate risk, interest rate risk. Hedging that kind of stuff belonged in the office of the CFO. 
But now we're developing this whole concept of enterprise risk management. It's much broader than exchange rates and interest rate risk. A lot of it's operational stuff. You know, um, what happens if a global supply chain breaks down? Um, you know, this is operational stuff, but it's got huge financial implications. So we started to try to find out from the CFOs what was going on out there with respect to this stuff. Um, should risk management still be primarily in the office of the chief financial officer? Should there be a chief risk officer now? If there's a chief risk officer, should the CRO report to the CFO? Or should the CRO report to the CEO or the board? Um, how was the CFO now going to operate in this world of a much broader definition of risk management when so much of it was operational kind of stuff? There's some data around that I've seen that suggests that the job of COO seems to be disappearing. And there is some suggestion that de facto, more and more in companies, the CFO de facto is taking the role of the COO. So clearly seemed like there was a change going on in the office of the CFO. We talked a little bit with uh, the, our participants and also the survey about structuring a finance organization. Uh, we got these matrix organizations now in um, companies out there where we're business unit CFOs who have joint uh, reporting responsibility to the corporate CFO and also their business unit leader. I don't know. Conflict of interest? What should be the primary responsibility of the business unit CFO to the corporate CFO to the business unit manager? Is it a good idea for the business unit manager to think the local CFO is a spy from corporate there to figure out all the bad things that are going on? Is that going to develop a healthy relationship between the business unit manager and the local CFO? So there seem to be a lot of issues going on these days in the office of the CFO. By the way, folks, a little anecdote, we also had a one-day forum on campus for chief marketing officers. This wasn't even on the agenda, but one thing that kept coming up was that there seemed to be in particular a problem in communication between CFOs and marketing folks. Could I see that shock look on the face of all of you? <laughs> the, Marketing folks were magnanimous, however. They were willing to admit that part of the problem was theirs. They didn't know how to communicate their ideas in ways that would resonate with finance people. But folks, they felt part of the problem was on your side, too. You weren't willing to meet them halfway to help them to understand the financial implications of their ideas. And so it seems like there is this changing role for the CFO these days. By the way, one other anecdote. Um, our CFOs in our open enrollment program were telling us that they were understanding this responsibility, that it was more important for them to be spending time with the business unit management looking forward, and then along came Sarbanes-Oxley. Oh my God. I was now ready to allocate more time to looking forward, looking at the future, but now I'm personally responsible for the quality of the financial information, whether I put it together or not. Maybe I better go back to spending more time doing the accounting part. Clearly, there were some big issues out there for CFOs. So we've got a wonderful panel here, a variety of different um, areas um, in our, our economy. And so what I'd like to do is to use that for some context for a conversation now about uh, their views on this changing role for CFOs these days. And, I'd like to start off by asking our, our panel, um, do you think that maybe we need to have a different background for CFOs these days before they become CFO? Do they need to spend more time in operations? Can that be um, sort of uh, a little bit of time in operations? They need to have an operations job these days. Um, any ideas on that from our panel? So. I'll be happy to, to go first. Um, one of the things that I was thinking of uh, when we were talking about these topics a little earlier is that in the conversations we've had today, um, what I've heard often is the, the many pieces that fall under the CFO umbrella now. And just to see if folks are listening, how many folks think that's less than 10? How many people think it's about 10 to 15? Raise your hands, no one's stopping you. 10 to 15, how many think it's more than 15? 
Okay, so people only responded to more than 15. Now, to actually learn one of those, how many people think you can do it in less than a year? Two to three years? Three to five? All right, so I'm, I'm guessing about three. So my math ain't so good anymore, but if I do 15 things in three years, by the time you learn all of these things, can someone help me? Okay. Most people will retire, right? So I, I think part of the challenge for each of us is recognizing which of these things we're going to build within ourselves and which of these things we're going to hire and which of these things that we may need in the future and which of these things we, we may not. And I think that's one of those challenges. I wonder if for some of the research that you cited, part of it is in, in my thinking and please be interested in your feedback, is I think there's a pendulum, right? There's a pendulum for the CFO role of how many of the CFOs you know, feel like they should be in the Gordon Gecko mode. Greed is good, right? How many of the CFOs think they should be in the, uh, and, and forgive me, my, my memory fails me, of the, the cop who got Al Capone, right? And what did we get him for? Treasury, right, tax, right? And that balance, that equilibrium changes. And because of what happened in regulation, I think you saw a lot more companies, you saw a lot more boards going to, no, no, we need that gatekeeper. But then business changed, and now we need this person instead. And I think the truth is, is that um, we each have to be like Baskin Robbins. There's 31 flavors or more. And to be able to build that and to be flexible enough to understand which ones we have and, and which ones we don't. Does that make sense? You raise your hands, don't raise your hands. Middle fingers, <laughs> something. I, I mean, I was fortunate to have a path uh, over the number of years that afforded me uh, various roles in and out of, out of finance. I was able to run uh, our small business units and had a collection of six offices around the country for a period of time. I had um, foist upon me uh, Y2K IT when I did an analysis from finance and said we weren't going to have a system. And the chairman of the company politely informed me I had just volunteered to get it done. <laughs> Um, and had also during some mergers where we were, we were making a lot of acquisitions, uh, stepped out of the CFO role to let one of my uh, cohorts kind of step in and stay because he had worked with that current president and I wound up running uh, some operations and some HR. So I had a, a good flavored background. It doesn't mean you have to go that route, but it means at a minimum when you're in a CFO role, you need to have some empathy and understanding of some of the roles you're dealing with. If there's a complaint from the field and from operations, and I think John alluded to this when he talked about the chief marketing officers, is you don't understand what I have to get done. You don't understand my world and what I'm trying to get done. They don't understand our world. We have to be very careful when we speak to them because they just will not understand when we talk about revenue recognition, when we talk about gap, when we talk about what we are allowed to do under certain rules and regulations. But similarly, we need to understand what pressures the field operations are under and how they need to achieve and also understand that they clearly don't know how to communicate to us. They don't know how, marketing doesn't often know how to make a presentation in an ROI format to tell you this is how much money we need to spend on this operation. It looks like a ridiculous waste of money and a junket. What's the payback? How are you going to quantify it? What do you get out of it? We have to actually be coaches and help them along. And Sometimes like you do with your children, okay, let me show you how to do it. This is how to get me to agree. They will learn. They will learn very quickly. From my perspective, coming up through the ranks, and you've probably seen this in, in CFO magazine articles and business news articles, they tend to pick the CFO every three years. It comes from the controllers group or it comes from the corporate treasury group. For some reason, people view corporate treasurers as having that wider variety of experience. I think you have to create your variety of experience. I worry about saying that CFOs need to have the operational experience before they can become a CFO creates a burden on folks and that it is something you can gain along the way. I happen to have, I oversee one of our programs as well as finance, so I actually have that operational experience. But before I became a CFO and gained that operational experience, I, I agree with what everybody's saying up here, but one of the things I had to do was actually go out, take those business unit leaders to lunch, take the marketing person to lunch, talk to them, 
say, I get it. We're at a standstill in a meeting. I'm speaking gap. I'm speaking revenue recognition. It's not making sense to you. I see it all over your face. How this is my goal, and my goal is to help you get what you want done as long as it's not illegal. I want to help you do it. How do we need to speak to each other? And I think that you can then gain operational experience by shadowing, I'll say, shadowing somebody in a business unit. You're not going to get it in five seconds, but you're going to get enough so that you can then support that person along the way. And, and it is, it's that partnership, it's relationship building with each other so that you share knowledge and then together you build a better business model. How do you, um, how do you develop that relationship with the business unit manager where um, you have this um, close relationship that you're a trusted financial advisor, you're there to help them understand the financial implications of what's being proposed. You're not there to say no. If you're asked for an opinion, you express the opinion, but if the business unit manager decides to go in a different direction, while you may not agree, you, you understand it's not your job to say no. Um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you develop that kind of relationship with a business unit manager that's uh, a comfortable and productive one. Have, have you had some experience where you've had that kind of relationship and where you haven't? And um, how do you handle it when you don't have that kind of relationship? I can, I can. Um, I, I've actually experienced being the one who says no and having that adversarial, adversarial relationship, but I've also experienced changing that same relationship and now it's a complete partnership. So when I came on board to Easter Seals, I would say no. But they would never give me the next sentence to say, but. And I've learned over time to put the but first and to start the conversation with, I know I'm the one who says no, but here's going to be the pattern. Give me your best creative solution. I may say no, but let me think about it in the moment, and then we can figure out how you can do it. Because my no doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means it can't be done that way but we may be able to figure out how to do it. One of the key questions that I've begun to ask is what are you trying to accomplish? Because most of the time people come to me, business unit leaders come to me and say, I wanna do this. And the answer is gonna be no, because it just won't work. But that's not the only solution to their issue. So my advice and my experience is ask what they're trying to accomplish and let them know. Don't stop being creative because this discussion came out as a no, keep bringing the creative ideas to the table, and that works. Over time, that very adversarial relationship took the person out to lunch, had a heart-to-heart, -heart, started to approach it the way I just described. Anytime there's a problem, that person comes running to me to say, is this really what's happening? And you know what? This is what I'm trying to accomplish. They actually shifted because I shifted. They shifted how they come to me with their solution. They come to me with what they want to accomplish, which allows the finance group and myself to be more solution-oriented in a way that's supportive of what they want to do. I would echo that. I would say um, a lot of time our first reaction when someone brings something to us is to want to choke the person and say, what are you thinking? Um, and you suppress that urge. But the next thing you have to do is have that, you have to have that patience to understand that what is and this will sound both somewhat arrogant as a CFO, but somewhat understanding. What is patently obvious to us is a wrong choice or a something not possible is not obvious to the person who's bringing it to you. And they just don't have the framework, your experience, and also your access to knowledge. You have to remember, we all operate from a much higher position of knowledge of the company, of the strategy, of what the CEO is thinking, what the board is thinking. So we know directionally where the company wants to go, and it's not always imparted in great detail to every person in the line. So it's that patience of saying, okay, it's no, and then it's finding the one thing that you can impart. Everybody likes to feel smart. In saying no, can you find one piece of education? You're not going to educate someone fully in finance, but can you find the one reason, the one item that the person can latch on to and understand and walk away from the conversation and say, okay, I get, I get the no or I think I get the no 
and I'm, but I'm, at least I'm smarter for it. So next time I'll be able to factor that into my decision making. I think um, two of the things that I would add as I continue to, to bore you with the dulcet tones of my voice. Um, one is the ability to, to build trust, I think, goes along with being able to disagree but commit. That our job is, and I think you're absolutely right, is to provide options. Uh, this may not make sense from a business reason. This may not make sense from a, a regulatory reason. But here are different options for us to go a, accomplish something. And one of the things I, I continually remind folks who have the misfortune of spending more time with me is that you know, businesses don't become profitable by having necessarily the best controls. Right? They become profitable by making money and making more than they spend is what this guy taught me. Right? Um, and you have to realize that that's, that's what you're, you're there to, to help do. So the, the disagree um, and, and commit, I think, is important. I think another part is, just, just as, as finance leaders, is making sure we're not putting our staff in that position where they have to choose, right? Of who is going to fire me? Is it going to be the corporate boss or is it going to be the business unit manager? And no matter what I do, I'm going to get fired. Right? and not putting our teams in those positions. So building structures, building systems, building communication channels, which doesn't always obviously lead to the finance guy gets fired. Because it's gonna be the finance guy. It's not the guy who's making the money for the company, right, often, often, right? Um, so I think that's a challenge. Uh, and, and personally, um, uh, during the, the lottery time, I actually did spend two years in, in India. Um, as the local CFO for a company based in San Francisco, and they put me in India because they wanted someone on the ground who spoke American. And they knew that I had the, the courage, to, and because I came from headquarters or, or from the local area, to call headquarters back and say, here's what's happening, because there were concerns about what was going on. And because they built a structure to where I knew that I was protected, it was much easier. But that's a challenge that each of us faces at, at different times. I mean, even now, you may have that challenge with your CEO and a board. Of when would you choose to go directly to a board instead of through your CEO? Suppose you have a business unit leader who has, for want of a better term, a vision, in quotation marks. And to be quite honest about it, you don't agree with the vision. You know, it doesn't make sense to you. Um, but the business unit leader ultimately gets to decide. And, you know, what if the business unit leader doesn't really like people questioning his or her vision? How do you handle a situation like that? I think when you, you know, the, the, at the first level, in, in the CFO role, you're the trusted advisor to the CEO in, in the first step. If you come across a business unit leader who is really, really just not going to stay within the bounds of where you want to take the company, then, then you have to hope that your relationship, or you've built a good enough relationship with your CEO where you can honestly go in and say, listen, this person who generally reports up through a different channel to the CEO is taking us down a path which is harming the company. And it's sometimes you have to do it more formally and say, hey, listen, they're going down this path. These are my disagreements. This is why I, I think it's wrong. And here's what the alternatives are to making it better if they exist. And it has to be formal. Sometimes it can be informal. Just, hey, what's going on with this person? Why do they continue with this? Why are they pursuing on that? You might want to check in with them and get them back in the, in the program, so to speak. But Tom, what if it's the CEO's vision you disagree with? If it's not, you can only, and I've had this, these disagreements, you can only make your disagreements known. As long as it's not illegal, you are somewhat stuck. If it's illegal, you have a fiduciary responsibility to go to a board. Um, I had a CEO in a prior company taking, making decisions that, while they weren't illegal, they were borderline uh, unethical and not putting things in front of the board. And, and ultimately, the CEO was moved out of, out of her role by the board. And I had, the C, had the board contacted me to ask me, literally to cancel a vacation because they thought I was going to have to come in and walk her out of the building. Um, but well, ultimately what happened is they decided to make a more gentle switch, but relied on me to give them a, a honest, straightforward assessment of what was going on in the business. You're going to be called upon to do that. And ultimately, in a, a, an equity-owned company, your, your, resp your responsibility is to the board, which is primarily driven by the equity partners. I'd just like to add to that. I think it's 
the question and the answer for me follow from the very last question that was asked. Everything that Tom said is accurate and true, but when we sign on for an executive role, our boss generally is the CEO. To some extent, it is the board when we have to go there. And I think sort of what I said before, you say no, and then you ask, what is it you're trying to accomplish? And you give the person different options that may or may not be acceptable, whether I agree with them or not, there are other acceptable options. They get the right to choose. And once they choose, now you've given them what's the risk of each option, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let them choose. You now have to live with it as an organization, as long as it's not illegal. We're, we're talking about maybe I still disagree, but as a senior leader of that organization, once that decision is made, I actually have to move forward with it as an organization leader. So I, I don't know if that speaks to a little bit finer tune. I, th I think part of it, if I, if I may, is also um, changing the role from being a gatekeeper, mm -hmm. right? That why does the decision have to come to you for a, a yes or no? And if you keep on giving the, the unpopular <laughs> response or decisions no longer going to, to come to you, which is a risk in itself. And can you change your role from being that gatekeeper to being more of a participant in, in strategy? Right? Are you at the table helping making that decision, being constructive with that salesperson who you all adore, or that, that marketing person as well, and being part of the team who's trying to make, make a difference? And I think if you can work on changing your role in that process, and, and everyone, no one's going to forget that you're the gatekeeper if you're sitting around the table. But um, it, sometimes if it helps to blur the lines, and not in a Robin Thicke way, but to blur the lines and to be part of a, a team necessarily, with, not necessarily with a specific title. And I think that goes a long way in terms of, of building trust. And that's some of the feedback that you know, I've, I've gotten for the folks who have the misfortune of reporting to me, is that someone will come back to me and say, wow, you know, I had forgotten this person was in finance because they were trying to help the, the business. And that comes back to your earlier question of, of building that trust, building that track record as, as, as well. I, I would I just add one thing is, is we all have to go through decisions uh, and support decisions we don't like. So our next job is to ultimately be prepared to figure out how to get out from under those decisions when we inevitably know they're going to fail. Right. You have to have the backup plan or the exit strategy. Right. And I, I think our role has evolved from that bean counter in the back office to the trusted advisor. We're the strategic, my words, the strategic business advisor to everybody in the organization. Let me just um, ask you about what you think about this. I've got a, a finance person at a business unit who has matrix responsibility to the corporate CFO and the business unit leader. And uh, that can get a little confusing, if not conflicting, sometimes. Um, how do you think that should be handled? I mean, should that, shouldn't the primary responsibility really be to the business unit leader and secondary responsibility to, corp to the finance organization or not? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, they're, they're all looking at me. <laughs> no, I, 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 I think, think I have a disagreement. Well. Yeah, that's why. Good, good, good. good. Um, just... what, what I'll tell you is, I, I think it depends, right? In some cases, um, you may have a business unit within uh, the same legal entity, right? In other cases, that business unit might be in a different legal entity, and that business unit head has other risk obligations as, as well, right? So uh, I think it, one of the important factors is, what's the risk structure of the entity? Because if that person is responsible for the risks in that specific area, then I think they should report back to corporate. If they're not, then I think you can have that person report into the, the business unit as well. The, the challenge is, and what I've seen many business unit managers do, is they'll, they'll go to finance for help, get a response they don't want, and then decide, you know what, I'm going to hire my own person to go do this for me. And so it's a, it's a balancing act, and part of it is personalities, and part of it is training as well. Just like each of us, um, well, for myself at least, um, you, know, you won't necessarily be able to develop all the skill sets in that, that role that you're asked to fill. That may be the case for our peers as well. Um, how many of you are fortunate enough to work for CEOs that have everything you would possibly want in that CEO role? Anyone? 
It's not just the lights, right? Okay, so, so one out of a, a hundred, maybe, right? So in the same way, we have to manage that within ourselves and within our teams as well. Tom, you disagree? I, I not, not entirely. I mean, I think, only because I think you need the local, you need the local finance to report to their local managers, especially if it's out, uh, if it's in an international basis. Uh, they need to be tied into the local country. They need to be tied into local division and markets. It's your, our job to make sure that our global and our corporate, depending on, on our structure, our corporate finance operation is strong enough to enforce the corporate rules. That doesn't mean they necessarily need to have these people in the field reporting because then it does lead to a somewhat adversarial relationship between the local person and the field management. At the same time, you have to be cognizant that occasionally you have to pull the field people back and say, you're not following standard guidelines. And these are the standard corporate guidelines which need to be followed. Okay, um, I think we've got a few minutes left. Do we have any questions from the group for our esteemed panel? It's over here. A couple of answers, John. Carlos, come. Writing the lights, that's what he does. Ah, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> You're right, right in the light there. Thank you. I just want to add a little bit to, to the matrix uh, management. Thanks. I just want to add to the uh, matrix management discussion. Um, I, I live that role, um, and uh, it really boils down to uh, the personalities. I mean, it, you know, the, the, the key to a success in, in that type of environment is to have two strong personalities. Um, the, the, if, if the local CEO uh, is more domineering than the CFO, um, then it's, it, it's, it's not going to work. Um, but I, I, I've, I've seen it personally. Uh, it, it works very well when you have two matched uh, players that, that are, are driving the business the right way. Because then there's, then there's a, a, a healthy tension between the two roles. So the answer is it depends? No, I think the answer is that it works very well, but you've got to, you know, if you are a CFO in that, in that role, you better be an A personality. I think a weak, a weak finance person is a weak finance person, whether they report to me or, or to a local manager. Hello. Uh, so what advice would you have for a CFO who has limited experience with acquisitions if your company is about to go into acquisition mode? A lot of caffeine because you're in sleep. <laughs> Get to know lawyers really well because you'll spend a lot of time in their offices. Um, I, you just have completed somewhere. I mean, I've done it. The last TMP when we built, we did it with 60 acquisitions in the 90s. If I, uh, I, there's an anecdote from uh, Warren Buffett, which I think is great when it comes to mergers and acquisitions deals. Don't ask a barber if you need a haircut. Mm -hmm. uh, be careful about who you go to advice for in doing an acquisition. Make sure the incentives are right for them to be giving you objective uh, advice if you don't have the background yourself. Get, get yourself some structure also. Right. Build, build yourself, get some tools, get some standard playbook tools, things you want to look at and do diligence. Um, if you, you know, your advisor firms should help you with that, but if not, there's, there are plenty of standard due diligence templates learn what's important to your business, what, you, what you're acquiring, you need to look at. The things that are important in your business are probably important to look at in the acquisition business. And then just read through all that material and, and take it off, really. Dig, dig in deep, look for the problems early. I, I think it's part of the, the build or, or hire decision. Right? That, mm -hmm. depending on the timing, you may not have the opportunity to build that skill set yourself. So understand enough to, to ask the right questions, leverage your, your network. Um, and make sure, you're, as, as uh, Dr. Percival said, that you hire the right people to mm -hmm. help you with the right incentives in mind. Yeah. We, we walked away in my last company, we walked away from an acquisition after meeting with their board members to tell them that they didn't realize it, but literally the following day the company was going to be out of cash. The board member knew that. We figured it out. Now, something that we've done, we have a, a bunch of us that are good at the merger acquisitions. We want to educate the masses. So I think what everybody else said, don't be afraid to hire it if you don't have enough time. But one thing we're doing is being proactive in the world and we're bringing in a consultant who has no um, vested interest in whether we do an acquisition or a merger. But we're gonna take our top 20 people and have them sit in a room for three days and be trained on the process so that going forward for the future, 
as ideas come forward, there's at least 20 people instead of two that are prepared to at least think about the concepts as they come up. So I would say don't just think for today. You need to solve your problem today, but you also don't want to repeat the problem in the future for anybody else. You want to actually prepare the organization proactively. And get a good project manager yeah. because yes. yeah. we all have jobs to do and so does everyone else involved. You need someone to manage that process for you. Tactically, see if you can get a flat fee from whoever. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it comes back yeah. to incentives as well. Because if that person is incentive for a deal to happen, then the data they share, the analysis they do is going to be different. If that person is incentive for a deal not to happen, guess what? It changes. But if that person gets paid no matter what, then it's easier for them to give you the, the right response. I think we might have time for one more. Okay, I guess everybody wants a drink. All right. <laughs> oh, wait. No, we have one. Yeah. Um, today's conference is pretty much um, there's an uh, underlining tones of collaborations across the, you know, the supporting groups or units, uh, business units and somewhat. Um, I guess my question is, um, when is when is collaboration? Is too much collaboration? It's meaning that um, when does the CEO get to make uh, decisions um, over the vice president that are supporting um, his or her decisions? Um, I guess it's more toward governance. You know, what is the proper level of governance to ensure the proper level of collaborations? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. And honestly, what I look at is um, not necessarily a hierarchy or structure, but our ability to wield influence, right? Um, and that's one of the questions we were talking about earlier of, well, how many people are in your organization? Well, my organization might be this big, but I feel like I exert influence over this much. And it's the same thing with the, the question that you asked of, um, is your CXX going to come to you because you have influence because of the trust you've built, because of the track record you have, because of your knowledge of either the, the industry or the business or your ability to do the right thing for the company and the individual. Um, and you have that influence to where who works for who doesn't come into the mm -hmm. play or, or you know, we don't have to make decisions based on org charts. I mean, ultimately there is a decider and it, it generally in us, right? Um, but if you have that ability to build that influence within the organization, within the people that you work for, the, within the people you support, um, from some of the things we heard earlier today as well, then I think not having that conversation, not having to go to who's more important to the company, that am I afraid that she's going to leave or she's going to leave if I make a decision? So I, I think if you can work it to avoid a, a, a confrontation, um, that may be beneficial, but that's not always going to be the case. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much uh, to everyone on the panel. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you, uh, Dr. Percival, for uh, moderating that. Um, we have a few um, other items before we get to run and, and grab a drink and a little snack uh, next door that we'd like to uh, address here. Um, first off, uh, the CFO Dimensions Awards. Um, so we, uh, this is the second annual CFO Dimensions Awards, and we have uh, a great raft of awards. And um, people ask, well, why do you do this? Um, and it's to celebrate not like that, well, we'll be doing that shortly, um, but it's that um, the folks who work in the office of the CFO, and uh, of course, I'm speaking from experience here, and I'm probably biased, um, but I think they work as hard or harder than anyone else in the enterprise, and I think they on purpose take less time um, to congratulate themselves, to celebrate the victories. Every month close is a victory um, for the office of the CFO. Um, all of those projects, all of the value driving, I think we feel like it's our responsibility to just be working, working, working. Um, so we want to uh, pause for a moment and celebrate um, the victory of doing great work for our companies, giving back to our communities, increasing the shareholder value, um, these are uh, the things that we, you know, very few people stop to pat the CFO, the controller, the treasurer, et cetera, on the back, and this is our opportunity to do that. So we will do that um, very quickly here and run through these so you can uh, 
get into the next part of the event. Um, but we, we definitely want to pause to celebrate these fantastic um, award winners. The first award is CFO of the Year. And we have two of these, one for public company, one for private company. And the CFO of the Year is not just someone who's driving good results now. It's someone who's building a fantastic organization. It's someone who's a great leader, a great manager, a great communicator. Um, and this uh, is someone like actually those who were here uh, listening to uh, Tom Conforti this morning. Um, he didn't just triple the value of one of his companies, he's tripled the value of every company essentially that he's been at for the last three, and these are huge organizations. Um, so it's folks like that who are building uh, all of the mechanisms that make companies great out of the office of the CFO. And our, uh, our winner for CFO of the Year public company, Sean Agarwal, is the CFO of Trulia Inc. And um, he unfortunately could not make it uh, today, he sends his apologies. But Elizabeth Brown, uh, the VP of HR, um, is here to accept on his behalf. So I'll ask uh, Elizabeth to come up. John, thank you very much. Please send him our congratulations. Um, all that great hard work that he's done, the value that he's built, uh, and truly uh, wonderful work. And thank you so much for coming to accept us. Absolutely, you may. Um, yes, there we go. Yeah, it's, um, thank you. Yes. Um, I'm thrilled to be here um, and accept this award for Sean. Um, he, he's honored to receive it. He's excited about the role the CFOs are playing, the expanded role, more than just a, um, a financial steward, but really that strategic partnership, what you were talking about, Raul, the blurred lines, um, and being a strategic partner to the CEO and board. Um, he's actually, oh, thank you, although it was fun to, to do that. <laughs> um, he's actually part of the reason I joined Trulia. It was my meeting with him um, that I saw the great opportunity. He painted such a great picture um, for growth, for opportunity. Um, and I was excited once I joined to see that other employees um, valued him and respected him just as much as you know, I was taken by him during the interview. Um, so everything I've heard from the panel is, is exactly what Sean is. Um, he's definitely a key partner. Um, but what I think stands out about him is he's an inspirational leader. Um, the employees are very much inspired. I thought I'd give just a couple examples. It might be fun, from, fun for you all to hear from the other end. Um, so after quarterly earnings, he gets in front of all the employees and he walks them through the earnings um, so that we fully understand what we should be excited about, um, what we should, you know, why we should still keep the foot on, our, on the gas. Um, so that we, we all understand it. And then I notice in meetings, um, he's incredibly thoughtful about his comments and questions. Um, he asks us questions as a way of teaching us all. Um, so, you know, have you thought about this? Or might you pause to explore that? And it's just a wonderful teacher um, in a very respectful way. Um, but he really has guided us and taught us all. And so I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled that, that you all see him as a great talent because we do too. So. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You. Thank you. That's great. So CFO of the Year Public Company, Sean Agarwal. Next is uh, CFO of the Year Private Company. This is Jeff Haslow, CFO of the Nolan Group. Um, is uh, Jeff, there we go. Please come on up, Jeff. So, oh, pleasure. Thank you so much. And, you know, CFOs of private companies don't get all the acclaim that CFOs of public companies do, but you're doing virtually the same work, just in a different milieu. And um, that's uh, an unsung, unheralded job. But congratulations on doing such fantastic work. Thank you very much. You bet. Oops. I don't think I'm going to be able to forward the slides with this. Let's try a different tool here. <clears throat> um, most effective finance organization. Um, so as I say, no man is an island. Um, and it takes uh, a village. Are there any other horrible uh, references I could make? Um, the finance organization in a company such as AT&T's is huge. Um, and uh, you have to hire and trust 
fantastic people. You cannot do this alone uh, to move a company of that size. Um, so uh, building one of those organizations that's incredibly effective and produces fantastic results year after year is something that we celebrate. John Stevens, Senior Executive VP and CFO of AT&T, is the winner of this year's award. He could not make it, unfortunately, but um, accepting on his behalf is AT&T's corporate controller, Paul Stevens. No relation. Paul, can you? Please come on. behalf and for John thank you very much appreciate it all right you. you bet send him our best wishes <laughs> next up visionary CFO and, and you've been listening to some of his vision here um, during this panel conversation visionary CFO is um, is people who look beyond the traditional uh, role of CFO and uh, I like to think most CFOs uh, play this part to some extent but there are folks who are more backward looking more forward looking more hesitant to adopt technology, more aggressive, um, to reach out and figure out how we help add value to our corporation now and in the future. Um, so uh, someone who is emblematic of a great vision as CFO is Rahul Mathur, VP of uh, uh, FP&A, so you don't have to be a CFO officially to Certainly not. get this, absolutely. Uh, VP of FP&A for Expansion Corporation. Congratulations. <laughs> Congrats, you bet. And finally here, um, and we really stacked this panel, <laughs> I must say, is uh, the award for leading by giving. This is one of my favorites. Um, we are so busy. I think we're the busiest people in the enterprise, although my CTO is always arguing that the engineers spend more hours. I doubt it. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's great to be able to give back to the community, and, and Cheryl Marks Young has done so many things to give back. Uh, not only within the company that she's working uh, uh, for, uh, but all the good works that she does while she's on company time or not. And a lot of the work that she does in being so effective as a finance leader of Easter Seals, New Jersey, directly leads to them being more effective as an organization in their ability to give back to the broader community. So congratulations, Cheryl Marks Young. <laughs> Okay, so we've got one last item before we get to go and have a, a party, and, and this is going to be a great thing. Um, we have, uh, for those who have been busy um, uh, entering or getting stickers in your books and, and filling out surveys, and we thank you all for all of those activities, um, we have a great MacBook Air that uh, we want to give away, and, and here to help us do that is Matt France, who's the CFO of GCE Cloud. Matt, please come on up. And Matt, uh, we'll go ahead and, and reach in here. Tell you what, I'm going to do the honors now. Uh, it's going to be, this will not be easy here. So we're going to go on up here, I guess. We want to make sure, is someone from Deloitte here so we can certify the proceedings? And this person has to be present to win this. So we're going to call this out until we've got, uh, got someone here. All right. And the winner is Robert Schiller. Robert, do we have a Robert Schiller? My goodness, he's going to be so disappointed. All right, looks like we have a second chance. I'll grab that. <laughs> Next up. All right. Uh, next up is Charles Miller. Charles Miller. Right. There we go. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, Matthew. And GCE Cloud, thank you so much. Congratulations. All right. So, we want to do a couple of thank yous here before we let everyone go. Um, number one, thank you to all of the speakers and panelists uh, today, everyone who participated. What a fantastic job. I was receiving fantastic feedback all day long about all the speakers. Um, they worked hard to prepare, and um, they, I think, did a fantastic uh, job of uh, helping us uh, learn how we can be doing our jobs more effectively. And that's something that never ends, and we appreciate all of their great help and support. If we could have a round of applause for all the great speakers today. Next up, our sponsors. We literally cannot do this event, or most of the events that we do, without the support of our sponsors. Uh, SAP, our diamond sponsor, our 
platinum sponsors intact and NetSuite. And everyone um, who is a sponsor helped support our event today, helped us uh, find great speakers, uh, not just members of the companies, but practitioners, their clients, uh, uh, subject matter experts, very helpful. We really appreciate uh, that our sponsors are so supportive, and they enable everything that we do at Performative, whether it's online in the community or offline here live in an event like this. So if we could also give it up for the sponsors of today's event. We appreciate that. And uh, finally, and I think most importantly, thanks to all of you for coming out. Um, it was fun and educational. It was great interacting with everyone. We love hearing from our user base. We are never, ever satisfied. So anything that um, you saw today that could be done better, we want to hear from you. If you liked it, we also want to hear from you so we can do more of it next time. Uh, but it was great meeting all of you and having fun today. We appreciate your time. It is so difficult to get out of the office these days. Everyone is so busy. Um, busier certainly than the engineers at most companies. <laughs> and um, we appreciate your, uh, the your time and the value of your time, so thank you for that. We look forward to seeing you at performative.com. I gave a little view of performative. Many of you are very active on the site. You visit us frequently. If you do not, it's truly a resource unlike any other. It's free. It's noise free. It's just the folks in the room talking to one another, but offline asynchronously. It's a great resource, and we hope you can take advantage of it. I am closing CFO Dimensions 2013. Thank you, everyone, for coming.